indeed God protects us day by day. And this day, we're privileged to come before him in his name. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ forgive this be with you always. Amen. I invite you to turn to share God's peace with those around you. We'll continue with selected verses from Psalm 143, followed by This is the Feast. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. Enter not into judgment with your servant. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I stretch out my hands to you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy.
with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Dispel from us the works of darkness and grant us to live in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, that our faith may never be found wanting. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle reading is from St. Uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing the Alleluia and verse. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. 
he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with our next hymn.
if you can or not, but think back to last year at this time. <laughs> I don't know if that seems so far away or if it seems just like yesterday. <laughs> or maybe we don't know because that's what the year 2020 has done to us. Um, anyway, last year at this time, we were going through a worship and sermon series on stewardship called Experiencing the Joy of Generosity. And it was a, a three-week series. Well, this year, of course, very unique year, to say the least. And in some ways, we're going to do the same thing, only simpler. Because, you know, it, we should do things simpler in this very challenging time. And so we're going to do a one-week series this year. And that week is, you guessed it, today. However, there's one thing about this year's version. I'm not going to give you any instructions whatsoever. And you may be asking, well, Pastor, why do you say that? And why aren't you giving any instructions? The reason? Jesus did the same sort of thing in his parable of the talents. One of the interesting things about this parable that we heard earlier is that, as Jesus tells us, the master gives out his possessions, but he doesn't give any instructions at all on how to use them. He just gives. And he expects his servants to know what to do with them when he goes away. Now, one suspects that had there been instructions, uh, well, someone at first service said, uh, past, uh, if, if there had been instructions, those three servants wouldn't have read them anyway because they're guys. <laughs> and, you know, who needs to read the instructions, right? Okay, well, okay, well, had there been instructions, you could say that the servant who feared his master would have followed those instructions to the letter. Careful to observe every jot, every tittle, each and every stipulation. Why would he have done that? Because of fear of retribution. And I'm going to be going back to that a little later. But again, we're told of no such instructions to follow. The master simply gave gift. Some to some more, to some less, and along with that gift, he gave the freedom to use the gift, to use it in faith. And that's going to be important here in a little bit. And so two of the servants in the parable do exactly that. The one that received five talents and the one that received two talents. They rejoiced in the gift that was given and the opportunity to use the gift given. They joyfully use it. They happily meet their master when he returns. They don't seem too concerned whether the master expected a greater return on his investment or not. Again, they are simply happy. They are pleased to come to him and seem to know that he will be pleased with them. And we just lost our, our uh, uh, thing here. They are faithful servants. They enter into the joy of their master. They are full of faith, those two servants. But the other servant, he's different. From the moment he receives the gift, he is dreading the master's return. He sees the gift not as an opportunity, but as a burden. Something to worry about. Here we go. We're back again. Okay, so the first two are faithful servants. This, and then the servant that had received the one talent, he, the gift he gets, all of a sudden he sees it as a burden. Something to worry about. So when the master returns, this servant's not happy. He's living in uncertainty. He's consumed with doubt because he really doesn't seem to know his master at all. He doesn't think he's very generous. 
he only thinks that this guy is a hard guy to work for. And so you could say this servant is full of fear. He's a fearful servant. He doesn't enter into the joy of his master. So the question then is, how is it in your life? Examine your heart. What kind of servant are you? Are you living full of faith? Or are you living full of fear? It's a good question to ask ourselves, particularly in these days that we're living in. Am I serving God and those around me in faith? Or am I serving in fear? My friends, if, there's not, if you remember nothing else about this sermon, remember this. Jesus does not invite us to live in a world uh, filled with fear. He doesn't want us to be filled with fear, I should say, as we live in this time and in this world. He doesn't invite us to that kind of living. Instead, he invites us to live full of love and faith where love and faith respond in joyful service. And when the master returns to settle accounts, Jesus wants you and me to hear these words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Living in the master's joy means trusting in the God that Jesus reveals rather than in the God that we may imagine. And that's important to ask ourselves too. Am I trusting in the God that Jesus tells me about and reveals to me? Or am I trusting in a God that I have made up in my own mind? Our readings today turn to our eyes toward the end of all things, the vision of this is pretty horrifying if you ask me. In the epistle reading, uh, we heard this, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, that's the, end, the last day, will come like a thief in the night. People may be saying there is peace and security, everything's fine, you know, but then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. And then in our gospel reading, Jesus mentions in the parable of the talents about the worthless servant who is cast into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> and then the pastor is supposed to say, this is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> I, I always love that reading when it comes up. Uh, <laughs> such horror, however, can cause us to overlook one of the most horrifying details of all. In the parable of the talents, the cause of the unprofitable servant's sentence to darkness, the cause of his sentence is his own imagination. He chooses to live with a master he has imagined rather than the master who has revealed his generous love. And again, what kind of master are we by our lives and our attitudes and our thinking and faith living with? A God that we imagine and that we fashion in our own mind or the one who has revealed his love to us? In the parable, Jesus reveals a generous master, the one who gives all that he has into the hands of his servants. The amount that the master entrusts to his servants is astounding. By conservative estimates, one talent was worth 20 years of pay. 20 years of daily labor was one talent. And, and one servant gets five of those. And then later, <laughs> this, is, this is what's interesting, the master says, this was only a little. You have been faithful over a little. Oh, that's a little? And he sets his ser faithful servants over much. The unprofitable servant, however, lives with a different master, the master he has imagined. 
For him, the master is a hard man, reaping where he did not sow, gathering where he scattered no seed. Now here is the key. So I was afraid. You see, that's the distinguishing mark between him and the other two. So I was afraid. The servant's belief causes him great fear. Isn't that what happens? When we imagine a God of our own thinking, and we then imagine the worst that could happen, if we imagine the worst things can go in our own mind, where does that ultimately take us? Fear, right? Fear. We become afraid when we imagine and conjure up in our own mind and heart how things can go so bad. It paralyzes the servant, so he buries the master's talent in the ground. And when the master returns, that servant receives what he has believed. As he believes, so it is done to him. He is believing in fear, not in faith. Because he did not trust the generosity of his master, that servant is cast into the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus has come to us, revealing God's generosity. His Father's love is not to be measured in amounts of money, but rather in the life, in the death, and the resurrection of his Son, Jesus. Jesus has brought into this world a love that is priceless, a love that would not balk at the cost of sin, a love that would suffer and die so that the debt of all humanity would be paid and every sin forgiven before God. Unfortunately, there are many in the world who turn away from the God that Jesus has revealed, and they would rather live with the God that they imagine in their own mind. The God that they imagine, however, is not hard and demanding today, at least in today's culture, like the one in the parable. No, the one that, that many have in their minds today is not one who has made us in, uh, in his own image, but rather it's a God made in our own image, to our liking, to our specification. Instead of forgiveness, this God simply tolerates us. So turning from sin and being forgiven sounds strange in the world. After all, today's imagined God accepts us just for who we are and whatever we do. It does not matter. He simply tolerates us. But the God that Jesus reveals forgives us. God saves us not by our imagination. He saves us by his action. In Christ, God has entered the world and has acted to save us. His love goes beyond our imagination. He saves us not by becoming what we want him to be, but rather by being the one we need him to be. Our Savior knows the real danger of sin, and therefore he calls us to repent. Our Savior knows the cost of sin, and therefore he dies under the, our eternal punishment. But our Savior also knows the joy of his salvation and therefore rises again, not to tolerate it, but to forgive it and invite those to live in that joy. Living in the joy of our Master means turning away from today's imagined God and trusting in the God revealed to us in Jesus. And as we trust we live joyfully in service because instead of ruling harshly over us, God graciously rules through us. He acts and, and rules through his people. How does he do that? He gives according to the ability he's given to us. Not only has God gifted us, 
but he's gifted us with ability to use those gifts. But notice he does so in a different way. To one he gives five talents, to the one he gives two, and to another one. But my friends, it's not about the amount. The problem is, we Americans think more is better. He must have loved the one guy much better because he gave him five. No. Or we may think the guy that made more money is doing better in God's eyes. Again, no. Because look what God says. He said the same thing to the first servant as he said to the second. To both he said, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. See, the difference was their faith. It didn't matter on amounts because they were living and serving in faith. And so it, they didn't need to be consumed with, oh, I've got five, you got two, you know. No, it's, it's not about that. It's about how God's working. Think about for what God says in 1 Corinthians. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? In other words, God has gifted each one of us in the body differently. But that's how good God is. He gifts us according to our ability. And he's pleased. He has great joy in you and in me. And he wants us to serve in that joy, to live in that joy because of his gift and his gift alone. No matter how small, no matter how large, living in joy means living where God has placed you and me. And again, in these days, it's hard, sometimes hard to see the big picture. But you see, God's got the whole big, the big picture taken care of. And so he's given us an amount to serve him with. It may not be a lot, but again, it brings him great joy. And he wants us to live in that joy. Differently gifted, but equally loved. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Today in our prayers, we will lift up uh, those who are listed in peace this week. Um, let's see, I didn't receive the prayer uh, sheet uh, up here. Uh, so we will uh, continue in, in, in our prayers. We'll be uh, lifting up uh, those uh, friends and family of our congregation as well as our own members who have been diagnosed with COVID. Um, and so uh, those are uh, sadly becoming more numerous as the days go on. And also we'll lift up our brothers and sisters at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Brookfield. They extended a call to a pastor uh, where our member Greg Stanton is serving. Uh, that pastor declined that call. So uh, we'll pray for God's timing and God's will to be done in, in their midst. So as we come before the Lord in prayer, uh, we'll respond with the responses uh, that are on the screen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Giver of every good and perfect gift, we confess that no one living is righteous before you. And so we plead your mercy for us and for all people, that we might be given grace to stand before you on the day of judgment, clothed completely in the righteousness of the only faithful one, Jesus our Lord, and giving you our endless thanks and praise for your great mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son will return at a time when people do not expect. Give to all your people to live holy lives in this age, looking forward with eagerness to his joyful return, seeking only to be found in him on that glorious day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, watch over all your church, including uh, your people at Emmanuel Lutheran Church as they continue to uh, seek to call a pastor. 
Lord, help them to put their trust in you, knowing that you will provide in your time and according to your purpose. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Giver of all that we have, how often we forget that nothing is truly our own and that all belongs to you. Forgive us and help us to use your gifts wisely so that we may be a blessing to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of all nations, to you we commend our government, our armed forces, to all those you have placed in positions of authority, asking that you would guide them, bless them, and uphold them in every good deed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, our dwelling place in every generation, comfort those who mourn the death of loved ones. Also into your merciful hands, we also commend all who suffer at this time, those who are ill, those who are recovering, those who face surgery, those who suffer the effects of aging, those who are lonely and frightened, and all who have desired our prayers, including all those whom we've named, together with those whom we now name silently in our hearts. Grant them your peace, your healing, and your life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bountiful host, in the supper of our Lord, you spread before your people a heavenly feast of joy for them to share here on earth. Grant that all who come to your son's altar this day may receive his body and blood with living faith to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, your Son is the resurrection from the dead. And so we give thanks for everyone who has fallen asleep in faith in him, knowing that they live forevermore. Bring us to share with them the joys you have prepared and grant that on the last day, clothed in our resurrection bodies, we may join the heavenly hosts in singing your praises without end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now prepare our hearts to receive the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus. As we do so, I invite you to stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection to open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy,
Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. As we are sent forth in the Lord's peace, we uh, celebrate fruitful trees, the Spirit's sowing. <laughs>